You're listening to Talking Joe, and today we will be talking G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero 305. Spoilers ahead as normal. But before we get started, here's a few words from Serpento Khan. Greetings. Great Serpento changed my life. Great Serpento made me do good. If you want to win in the zombie fights, you, you must, must listen to what Serpento say. Eat some flesh, ignore your sauce. Hail the great, great Serpento. Only breathe mutant spores. Hail the great Serpento. And if you want to rule all that you survey, you must listen to what the great Serpento say. Accept no resistance from the Cobra base. Hail the great Serpento. Let's eat up the United States. Hail the great Serpento. And if you want to make your enemies pay, you must listen to what the Great Serpento say. G R E A T S E R P E N T O R. Great Serpento. Hey, 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 it's me, Mark, and welcome to Talking Joe, the G.I. Joe Comics podcast. If you're new to the show, you can find out all of the details over at the website, which is talkingjoe.co.uk. And joining me, as always, to talk about comics, it's a real American baked potato. It's Tim Finn. How are you, sir? I'm well, Mark. And hello, listeners. Tim, now a couple of questions for you. The the parody song opening the show today uh, is inspired by Thank You, Baked Potato by Matt Lucas, an uh, English comedian. It got, was very big over here during lockdown times. I'm assuming that uh, it probably didn't make it over your side of the shore. I'm not the best uh, <laughs> arbiter of pop music or meme music. So it's possible there are a lot of Americans who know this song and we would be having a different conversation with you. <laughs> and what about the concept of jacket potatoes or baked potatoes? Uh, how big on a, on a dietary scale are they over in the States? Um, I, I, think, I think moderate. I feel like in the 80s, the baked potato was a thing. Um, I think, although, you know, in 2024, there, I have seen a TV ad campaign for... Uh, for Idaho potatoes, <laughs> as opposed to potatoes from anywhere else. Uh, I feel like in the '80s, I would see TV commercials for chain restaurants that you know where the baked potato was a part of of your your delicious steak dinner. And maybe I'm watching different TV, or maybe the American mm. diet has uh, rotated a little bit away from potato. You know, in the in the '90s and aughts, people talked a lot about carbs. Uh, now they're talking about carbs again, differently, the same. Yeah, I'd say over in the UK, it's like a, a sort of a national icon dish. Like, if you're just looking for something quick to eat, you, you're probably going to look in the in the fridge or your pantry and, and find some jacket potatoes there. Stick them in the, the microwave uh, for for ten minutes, or maybe in the oven if you're feeling fancy. You know, put on some baked beans on top, and you know, bish bosh bash. There's a there's a quick and uh, tasty meal for you. Um, right, but this isn't the Jacket Potato podcast. This is Talking Joe. And today we are looking at G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, issue 305, which was released on the 20th of March, 2024. Before we get too far into uh, looking at the issue itself, we can catch up on some, some news. Hot and hot! Some general G.I. Joe news of interest is that we're going to begin seeing some of the trade paperbacks of these things coming out. Uh, so Void Rivals Volume 1 has been out and Duke and Cobra Commander Volume 1 will be out in June. So uh, if, you can, if you're one of those people that reads these things or collects as a trade paperback format, uh, you know, you're beginning to get involved in having something tangible in your mitts up front as well. Uh, a bit of the news that sort of slightly surprised me because uh, you know maybe I don't and don't necessarily get so many of the thin 
um, trade paperbacks these days was that the Void Rivals trade paperbacks seem very slim on bonus content, Tim. Uh, we have this at my store. Uh, it's been out for a week or two. Funnily enough, I haven't actually picked it up and flipped through it, and I tend to do that with all the new books. But I, I do think back to uh, the Walking Dead softcover collections, which uh, did, to my recollection, do not co- include the covers. And there was a book of uh, the first, mm-hmm. I don't know, 100 or so, or you know, 150 Walking Dead covers as a separate collection and i thought uh if that's what's happening here with the Ender john universe um i don't know that there's going to be a separate book with covers or all the variant covers but there is some precedent in the skybound publishing hmm. universe my my preference is uh a collection should include the covers i think they should be included as chapter breaks not all hmm. at the end unless Something about the storytelling really suggests that, um, and and The Walking Dead actually does work like this uh, on purpose, where the last page of an issue runs right into the first page of the next issue. And as a reading experience, maybe you, quote, should read all six issues together in a row without chapter breaks. Right. And I, I think they're probably going to to follow that publishing model as well, where they'll they'll release, you know, relatively cheap and straightforward uh, floppy trade paperbacks and then follow that up with a hardcover deluxe which will sort of have all of the bells and whistles so maybe you know more comprehensive set of covers sketches interviews commentary that kind of thing yeah Sky- with skybound um there are the slim you know six issue at a time paperbacks and and there are the compendia 48 or so issues at a time and big big fat paperbacks uh skybound also publishes for walking dead and invincible bigger hardcovers that are uh what is it about 20 something issues yes they're about 24 issues and then also bigger slipcase deluxe hardcovers and so there's there, there's the whole range of of, uh, of formats. I, I feel like there's sort of this unspoken, old-fashioned thinking from the late '80s and early '90s when Marvel and DC were starting to were figuring out how they wanted to approach trade paperback collections for comic book stores and the bookstore market. Um, you know, the first printings of any Marvel collections. Uh, you know, in the the Fireside books in the '60s and '70s. Origins of Marvel Comics, Son of Origins, the actual first like Marvel collections, Dark Phoenix Saga, uh, From the Ashes, Iron Man, Demon in a Bottle. Those did not include the covers. Oh. And uh, and sometimes uh, I've got I've got the first printing of um, uh, what is it? Uh, is it Origin of the Hobgoblin? It's got a Derek Yeniger cover of the Hobgoblin's face. And Marvel on some of the early collections would actually strip the credits from the first or second page of each issue so there wouldn't there wouldn't be a box with you know writer or pencil or ink or letter or colorist because they you know they were trying to sort of get away from this this format like it had been a monthly serial mm-hmm. sort of the, like the difference between watching an episode of the gi joe cartoon on tv where there's an ad break or watching it on vhs where there are no ad breaks or nowadays watching it on uh house rose youtube channel and there aren't ad breaks but the bumpers that go to and come back from commercial are still there and so there is this admission that it was a format with a particular setup you have a break every seven minutes and so i feel like these comic books are published as 20 page increments with dazzling marquee cover art and i don't think the paperbacks should run away from that Interesting. Um, next topic uh, is around Paul Pelletier. So he was announced as the fill-in artist for 306. We've seen a cover for 307 where he's credited as the artist there. And um, he's also been doing sketches at conventions. So, for example, Greg from Anything Joe's podcast 
uh, saw him at Lexington Comic Con and uh, he did him a lovely looking Scarlet sketch and I've seen uh, a, a um, Zartan sketch and he's also done uh, a couple on, on his own um, website where he's been been sort of putting those up for sale so that he's done a, a Snake Eyes, uh, a Baroness, a Destro and uh, he also did one for Diana Davis, Duke, more Duke. So uh, very much uh, getting into the G.I. Joe vibe, and it sounds like he will be doing more than just the one issue, uh, potentially uh, the next arc or so, which is, uh, yeah, interesting. And I think in terms of having, you know, talking about trade paperbacks again, if we're sort of looking at five issue arcs for a, for a trade, having that consistency of, uh, of artist is, is always uh, welcome. Jumping to the first bit of the letters page of issue mm. 305, the editor, uh, Alex Antone, uh, says, we're working on a very top secret G.I. Joe project right now. It's launching this summer, dot, dot, dot. And then mm. two paragraphs down, hats off to Chris Mooneyham for finishing his fifth issue in a row, um, which I, I think is a lovely thing to say. But that yeah. also feels very modern. Like, man, artists sure can't do, but can barely hold on and do more than three or four issues in a row. And here's our guy who did five. I think what he's actually saying is this is a hard book to draw and we're we're giving him a hard time. And then um, uh, I can't say enough good things about the energy that Chris has brought to this book. His next assignment is helping out with that top secret project. And then we're leaping him ahead for a new arc of a real American hero. Mm. You know, he's been given a bit of, uh, I think, a pause to let him uh, let the, the deadlines catch up. But then he's moving across to a top secret project for a bit before coming back to the, a new arc for, for a, a Ra. So whether that's five issues time or, or 10 issues time, TBC. But um, a, a top secret project, I'm sure, gave you all sorts of uh, tingles, Tim. Yeah, if I had to guess, it's a one shot, a series of one shots which might be a yearbook uh, or an annual or mm, cool. a, or a mini series. And I feel like what's being, what's being implied here is that Mooneyham starts to fall behind doing 20 pages a month, uh, which is totally reasonable. This is a very hard book to draw. And, 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 you know, we're, we're long past the, the era where sort of every artist is expected to be able to do a monthly book for a year or two, you know, nowadays, Artists sign on for five or six issue arcs, and then sometimes they come back after the next arc. So this seems perfectly in keeping with that, you know, DC, Marvel. So I think the idea here is that whatever he's doing, a miniseries, a special, a one shot is going to be, you know, one issue or four issues worth of material, but he will have more than one month to do the one issue or more than four months to do the four issues so that he doesn't fall behind on this other thing. And then if Paul Pelletier is doing maybe five issues, like, okay, then right when he finishes this other thing, Mooneyham can come back and pick up. I think that's the idea. And I had thought that Pelletier would be doing a single fill-in or maybe a fill-in and then Mooneyham and then another fill-in. And I thought, well, that feels very much like the Marvel 80s Joe, where, you know, Ron Wagner does two issues and then Marshall Rogers does an issue and then Ron Wagner's doing back doing an issue. And then, you know, Jeff Isherwood does an issue and then Ron Wagner does two issues or you know, something like that. And some of them are pencils and some of them are break breakdowns. Um, this is one of these books that, you know, different than a lot of sort of arc driven comics in the modern era. This is just month in, month out, grind, grind, grind. And as much <laughs> as I'd like to have one artist draw, you know, 10 issues in a row, it's 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 okay with me if someone draws three issues and then misses an issue and then draws two issues and then misses three issues and then draws five issues. As long as the other people are good, ideally they all sort of stylistically uh, uh, fit. But if it is going to be sort of a cleaner break, Mooneyham is on for five issues, off for five issues and potentially back on for five issues that is really tidy and i appreciate that um, not just from a scheduling point of view but from a you know reader and reader experience point of view and it you know makes the as you said the volume one and volume two and volume three of the softcover collections 
just sort of fit to that much better. Yeah. And um, as well, this sort of secret project sort of gives us a bit of room to to speculate about what potentially it could be. I like that, that thought that maybe it's a, a fancy yearbook. My guess is some sort of mini, um, but... I, do, I don't think it's I don't think it's the main book going bi-weekly, that's for sure. <laughs> no, but um, maybe, maybe something set in the past of G.I. Joe, like um, uh, something connected to the uh, L- LLRP, or maybe just like uh, year zero of G.I. Joe, something like that. Or I sort of think something like that might be coming a little later and that initially there's going to be this. This is this is a feeling based on nothing. It's just a feeling. I sort of feel like in the second year, there may be some flashback publication. And before then, there may be some sort of untold tales or like character you know it's like mm. a molto special a black hat special mm. Mm. uh a, a sherlock special something that hama can write uh sort of more off the cuff yeah uh and and since he has you know shown an interest in in these new characters mm. um and since maybe the the new skybound audience uh, doesn't know these characters i like that speculation I'm hoping for a little special which explains the story of uh, Jeffrey the Techno Viper and how he escaped at Cobra Island and the mutant zombie bomb. But we shall see. I'm sort of wondering <laughs> if if uh, if he's on the cover to 305. <laughs> it could you know, be. Did he did he not just get away, but he really got away? And uh, other bit of news from from this issue is that we're told that Brad Anderson is confirmed as a cover artist all the way through to issue 10. So expect a few more of those sort of uh, spotlight covers with a Joe in the foreground and a Cobra in the background. That is such a nice thing as a, a, a reader and a reader who likes those covers to read because it it just speaks to confidence and long-term planning and Mm. uh, a sense of continuity you know like you know when andy kubert was announced as doing the cover to 301 and i think it was like covers by 301 i thought oh well i'm sure they have them for three months you know and and you know i couldn't dare to hope that he would be doing (laughs) more covers than that but you know i think some artists like to plan ahead and schedule it's like all right i'm going to be doing x number of these for x number of months and certainly editors like to you know line that stuff up and you know if the if the talent is reliable then it sort of all works out but you know having kubert and walker really gives this series an identity um and that's that's great um I had a thought about uh, at Cuba as a as a cover artist and his approach, but we'll talk about that maybe in a in a second when we start talking about the the cover. Um, so on to three hundred five details. It is brought to us by the creative team of writer Larry Hammer, artist Chris Mooneyham, completing his fifth issue in a row, uh, colorist Francesco Segala with Sabrina Del Grosso as the flatter, letterer Pat Brousseau. Editor Alex Antoni, publication design Gillian Crabb, production Richard Mercado, and creative consultant Diana Davis. Tim, let's have a look at the covers, shall we? Let's have a look at the covers in the gallery. Yeah, the cover to 305, Andy Kubert and uh, Brad Anderson's main cover, cover A, is a bold there's that word again there's that andy kubert word (laughs) a bold shot of cobra commander full figure with his battle mask and a big flowing cape that's red on the inside strutting right toward us uh, at dusk dramatic lighting behind him in springfield with a welcome to springfield a nice little town sign uh, in the in the bit of compositional negative space below his cape, the Cobra Commander is uh, flanked and followed by a legion of Vipers, Techno Vipers, and Televipers. And there's something really cool happening here, where Kubert places the camera. So the if you take Cobra Commander out of this cover, 
you realize that we're looking at a little bit of a downhill, a little bit of a of a decline with the road and the sidewalk. And if you look at Cobra Commander's feet, you realize that the road swoops down, and then at the very bottom of the cover, it is swooped up again at us. It is dipped and then raised. And so the camera is actually on the ground at, I don't know, a foot high, looking somewhat up at Cobra Commander. And yet, because the Viper, Techno Viper, and Televiper just behind Cobra Commander are lower than him, the camera is in effect at sort of waist uh, height for them. So there's a very there's a very thoughtful and playful arrangement of characters of blocking in the space here. And so you get it's not a flat cover. It's not you know a bunch of cool cobras one foot in front of a wall or in front of no background or you know just in front of open sky. Um, Kubert has all this space to carefully put some suburban houses, some suburban trees, some suburban mailboxes, and then additional Cobra troopers in those other negative spaces sort of around Cobra Commander's uh, cape and and arms. Brad Anderson does something interesting where all the reflected light on Cobra Commander, so the the diagonal shadow across his chest made by his arm, uh, the one that's out and then holding the staff, and then also the underside of that arm, and then also the the knee and boot on his, uh, on the right, on his left. Uh, all those reflected colors are purple. And even though I don't think of Cobra Commander as blue uh, for his uniform as having any purple, um, by putting that blue into those shadow, excuse me, by putting those that purple into those shadow areas, Anderson is making Cobra Commander subtly agree with the Techno Viper and the Televiper, who do have that purple naturally in their costumes. Mm, very good. Um, I sort of had an observation about like the design of Cobra Commander here because it, it looks a lot like the original V1 in, in many ways, in terms of like his belt with that kind of Illuminati <laughs> triangle in a circle. Uh, Illuminati esque triangles so in a circle that he's he's got that you don't always necessarily notice on the on the original figure because it's so small, but there's a there's a big degree of like heft to him. He's got this cobra staff and he's got this black cloak with the uh, red on the inside, and, and and it sort of puts me in mind a little bit of some of the later Cobra Commander figures. There's a, a version seventeen from t- two thousand and four, which is kind of that. You know, Venom, Venom versus Valor era, where he's he's got a bit more of those sort of the cords um, on his on his tunic, and and um, around about then he he was being released more and more with a a cape. I think I think some of those capes might have had been black with a with a red inside. I'm sure that it does exist in in toy form, and and again around that time he was being released more and more with a kind of serpent staff as as well so a bit of inspiration i think is being taken from that that era funny enough the um there was a shipwreck that was released in 2003 which was i think part of spy troops where he came with some cobra commander gear he came with a black chrome helmet and a black uh, cape as as well so it's almost parts of uh, part of parts of that costume that and, and a staff, a gold serpent staff. So it's, it's it's almost sort of cribbing some from some of the um, that Cobra Commander era aesthetic. The the other thing that that sort of red cloak puts me slightly in mind is of that very famous uh, painting of Napoleon on the horse. Oh, there and there was a Cobra Commander variant cover. Yeah, and there was a yeah exactly a, a Cobra Commander variant cover that uh, homaged that. Yeah, it's the uh, it's called Napoleon crossing the Alps, um, very famous um, classical painting by French artist Jacques Louis David in the uh, early eighteen hundreds. So in the in the Napoleon painting, the the cape or the cloak is all red, whereas yeah. here it's the inside that's red. Uh, the way that in G.I. Joe, the movie, the animated movie, right? The beginning, Cobra Commander's black cape has red inside. The the ref- uh, There is a reference that this cover is making, for, for sure. Uh, G.I. Joe 305 by Andy Kubert 
is referencing the cover to G.I. Joe 10. Is that the Welcome to Springfield? Yeah, where Scarlet and Snake Eyes are trotting through... I've always thought it was... Uh, I guess it's the road and not the, a driveway, but whatever it is, a, a path. And in the background is a suburban house and this mm. same sign, uh, or sign that says the same thing. And then in the foreground... Uh, behind a, a wood facade of a front of a house are two Cobra soldiers with guns ready to sort of pop out and shoot Scarlet and Snake Eyes. And Scarlet is, I think, smiling in that cover. Yeah. Um, yeah. So these two covers form a kind of bookend at the mm. beginning and yeah. the current end of the G.I. Joe run. Um, something else that strikes me about this cover is that I'm not counting variant covers, but Cobra Commander hasn't actually appeared sort of big and front and center in all that many covers. Mm-hmm. He's uh, he's front and center on um, Shannon Gallant's cover to issue 227, uh, where he's got his hands behind his head like he's relaxing or like he's under arrest. And Destro and the Baroness are behind him, but there's sort of no background. There's just like a wall. Um uh, you know, he's on the cover to uh, 150, where he's fighting Snake Eyes. Um, he's on the cover to 100, issue Marvel yep. issue 100. I'm back by Ron Wagner. <laughs> um, and um, and again, if you are a, a, a follower of variant covers, you might be able to rattle off, you know, 10 right now where, no, 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 we've seen Cobra Commander, cool, pin-up-y, front and center um, action pose but uh not just in how it's drawn drawn and composed but also because it is cobra commander we actually don't have a lot of gi joe covers like this you know it's like i think of a book like batman where 99 percent of the time batman is on the cover and 80 percent of the time he is a prominent element on that cover you know there are a couple of batman covers where he's really small because it's actually about the villain or like Gotham city at night, or, you know, there's a couple covers where Batman's just not there because it's like just a drawing of the penguin's face, the Joker's face or Robin, you know, or Robin and Alfred are in some danger in the back cave or something. But uh, just going by sort of normal a covers as important as Cobra commander is, this is kind of the first time we've seen a cover like this, quite like this. Very good. Yeah. I was just, I was just having a flick through the, uh, the Yojo cover gallery while you were saying that. Um, and, and yeah, certainly there's, there's some iconic covers with him on. Um, this is kind of unique to, to kind of this cover in terms of what, what's going on. And, and my, my other thought was, is, is this promising something to some degree that isn't quite happening in this, this issue? There's, there's slightly less connection to, to the events of this this issue from from the cover than than maybe some of the earlier ones. I mean, certainly Cobra Commander is gearing up to defend Springfield from uh, Serpentor uh, Serpentor's invasion, but we don't get this kind of quite this sort of procession of through through the streets uh, that's shown here. And and I was sort of flicking ahead to three oh six and three oh seven, which is uh, essentially a, you know a slightly more iconic solo image of snake eyes and then destro and i'm just wondering whether p- potentially the cover artist is having to work a little bit further ahead from the ev- exact plot details uh, that are being being worked up by uh, larry harmer that uh, that maybe he's be like yeah snake eyes is going to take a more important role and we'll we'll see him back in that visor costume so so you know maybe maybe do something of that and yeah we're introducing destro back into the series and he's going to be taking a more prominent role so so you know do something with with destro but uh you can keep it iconic because we don't exactly know the plot uh, details yet at this stage i had started to i had thought the same thing i think that's cool i think it's okay you know, this cover and the next two that are more pinuppy and less story um uh, but man going back to the cover to 302 with the the you know joe's holding a a a corpse which manages to be both story driven representative of the issue and also a compelling image i would love to get back to that kind of cover 
Um, one, 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 one last uh, quick little bit. Um, uh, I did notice, as I'm sure other people did, that the Televiper is holding his video camera a little bit like a weapon. I'm okay with that because as a kid, I just pretended it was a big laser. Um, <laughs> yeah, it could be some sort of uh, weapon, some sort of, like a beam weapon or something. But or, or it could just be that he's uh, very aggressively, you know, recording what's going on. Funny enough, there was actually a bit of discussion on the Facebook group about this particular image prompted by the question, why is the televiper holding his camera like a gun? My initial reply was that he's visualizing going pew pew and shooting the things that he's recording. Uh, Bart said it's all radio waves. He can flip a switch and turn the camera gun into a microwave transmitter. Sorry, I'm a radio satcom guy. And uh, Jay says that maybe he's Cobra Commander's nephew, Eugene, and he's always wanted to be a Viper, but his aim is worse than the Stormtrooper, so they handed him a, a camera instead, probably with no film in it. Paul says, uh, to be fair, it does have a stock on the end of it, uh, and that's used to rest against his shoulder, so it's a design feature. Thanks to all the contributions there. Uh, um, and then the Techno Viper... His weapon, I think, is, uh, I don't have a, an image of the classified Techno Viper in front of me. I'm thinking of the original action figure. Mm. Um, his weapon does seem to be an actual Techno Viper's accessory, but proportioned quite differently to look more like more like a machine gun in its, a long gun in its shape and mm. less like a wel welding, you know, device. Um, and, you know, and similarly, like, I'm seeing some exaggerated or invented bits, I think, on some of these costumes. There's some ribbing on Cobra Commander's gloves. There's there's some, you know, ridges on the Viper. Um, and uh, and I'm okay with this. I'm okay, you know, these costumes don't have to be, you know, they can be halfway between classified and the 80s figures. They can be halfway between those two with some invented stuff. You know, as long as they're, as long as they're hitting the high notes. So we've got then the cover B, which is just the, the black and white version of this image. Then uh, cover C is another one from Brad Walker. Uh, this time it's uh, two female characters, a woman, uh, Dawn in the foreground and Baroness in the background. There's a great bit of contrast here where Dawn is rushing to the left and the Baroness is rushing to the right, in addition to the warm yellow, orange, reds of the lower part of the cover and the cooler blues and purples of the top part of the cover. Um, uh, this this is this is a pose on on Don Marino. You sort of you you tend not to see this pose on a lot of comic book covers. Someone sprinting. Uh, but it's 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 a very exciting dynamic cover. Turning away from us and shooting, you do get boobs and butt, but it doesn't it doesn't feel cheesecake, does it? Um, it doesn't feel cheesecake, uh, and it also doesn't feel impossible. There there are mm -hmm. some artists who have been <laughs> nicely called out on the internet, broken back poses. Yeah, for doing that thing where you see so much of the butt and so much of the breasts that um, it, it feels exploitative rather than uh, anatomical. Um, and I, I don't get that sense here. This Nothing about this cover seems sort of disproportionately uh, sexy or showy if it were a man or two men on the cover mm. uh, from this cast of characters. It just looks like capable, cool hero, capable, cool villain, great costumes, great drawing, great color. And then on retailer exclusives, we've got Mike Mayhew's web store, uh, variants continuing. Um, he's now, I think, printing these on a thicker card stock because they were getting damaged in, in post. So this is the fifth one of those. This time it is Storm Shadow against a white background. And he has said that uh, these have been doing very well for him. So he's looking to keep on going. So expect a few more. And then the final web store variant is Clayton Crane. And at the time of recording, we haven't yet seen that image uh, last time around the the uh, i believe the image only came out a few days after release uh, of you know the the wednesday release of the comic so it might be that uh, that it's a few days uh, after 
the uh, the actual you know day that the the regular comics comes out that we'll find out what the uh, the cover for this looks like but uh, they they are, are on his web store as an exclusive and they do tend to sell out pretty sharpish and yeah and i only know that exists because it's uh it's in the credits page as the the final uh cover being listed great clayton crane <coughs> mark from the future here bringing you news that the clayton crane exclusive is of serpentor uh three serpentils in one almost full figure uh, with a headshot behind and then Serpentor on his air chariot. Uh, this exclusive cover will likely go live on Clayton Crane's website the Saturday after release, which would make that Saturday the 23rd. But at the time of this recording, I don't have a formal announcement of that either. So look out. It'll sell quick if previous drops or anything to go by back to mark in the present oh doesn't he sound young (laughs) plot breakdown on the roof of springfield community center cobra uncovers evidence of serpentor khan's cyborg spies elsewhere in springfield in the attic of dawn's parents house dawn makes her report back to the pit noting that she has discovered a weakness there is a self-destruct mechanism within Cobra's new cyborgs. Dawn's parents' neighbour, a crimson guardsman, comes snooping around and he is knocked out by Dawn's parents. In the pit, the forensics team are examining the cyborgs from Snake Eye's cabin. And one of the inactive cyborgs' hands comes to life. The handroid is shot by Stalker. In a Quonset hut above the pit, Spirit, Lady J and Multo take down the three vipers that were snooping around and they prevent them from detonating a nerve gas grenade. At the revanche facility in Baton Rouge, a Python officer is helping Serpentor keep under wraps that they are installing chips that nullify revanche control. And at Castle Destro in Scotland, Destro and Baroness toast with Zartan to their new alliance. However, this Zartan is a simulcrum working for Serpentor. Elsewhere, the real Zartan is being targeted with a missile. To be continued. Tim, top down. I feel like we've talked a lot about art previously and you've had kind of mixed feelings towards towards that of Chris Mooneyham. So I'd be interested to see how you feel about this issue more generally and and maybe if you could talk about that point that that we discussed about kind of your your feeling about um your high level takeaway from from how you feel around chris's art yeah i don't want anyone to think that i don't like chris mooneyham's art i love chris mooneyham's art i think the the styles that he seems to be alluding to in how he draws um and one of the one of the letters in the letters page uh even even points it out uh mm-hmm. a fantastic blend of Kubert Sinkevich and Sean Gordon Murphy right and i i would throw in uh Jordy Brene he draws really well i love the grit i love the texture i love the shadows i would be okay with 20% less shadows cuz i just love seeing color on, on GI Joe and Cobra costumes and vehicles um uh, Mooneyham draws great faces and and eyes and textures, you know, and and okay. So where I think he his work could be a little stronger is storytelling and how he actually breaks down a page and picks his quote camera angles. And in the first three issues of this new run, I thought that there was a certain kind of repetitive shot where we kept seeing people straight on and close-ups of faces straight on and in and of itself there's nothing wrong with that but it started to feel like it was at the expense of pulling the camera back and showing more of the environments or pulling the camera back and moving the camera like five or ten feet to the left or right and showing the room at some kind of diagonal issue 304 uh, and i and i sent an email to postbox the pit uh after 303 saying saying this and saying i I sure wish 
Mooneyham's layouts were a little different. Um, and I even went as far as suggesting that perhaps the person who writes the comic, who's very good at laying out comics, could lay out uh, this comic. Um, 304, there were some improvements. I saw uh, much less of the sort of straight on and straight on close up at the expense of some environmental uh, exploration. And and 305 uh, somewhat continues that. There are There are a couple panels where I feel like we're looking at something straight on and I'd like a little more variety. But I am I am so thrilled that Skybound has found this artist to draw G.I. Joe. People online and in the letters page seem to really like his work. I have a friend who sees the same uh, what I would consider a limitation in the storytelling, and it sort of also jumps out at this friend. But I totally understand that maybe I'm the only person who sees this as as any kind of uh, weakness. And, you know, if Mooneyham drew this book forever, I would be very excited. <laughs> uh, so this is not like this guy's got to go. It's um, I would like I see an area for improvement. Mm hmm. And uh, if my letter shows up in print in the next issue, it's going to come across, I think, as really negative and damning. And and I, I think hopefully if, if it shows up and everyone reads it, it's it's sort of seen in the context of this guy's great. I think there is improvement. Mm. I think that's uh, that's interest. It's useful perspective uh, to, to see because sometimes sometimes you can see something uh, and you can and you can see just the bit you know you can see it you think it's great but you can see kind of the, the the bit that you think would just make it that much greater whereas uh sometimes you see something and you think it's rotten and you're like where to begin you know i can't pinpoint a single thing because everything's wrong with this you know but there we go i just i'm just sort of flick forward to, the, to page one and i was thinking noting to myself that we've got a, a page one splash page here and this is actually the first single image splash page that we've got on a page one of the five issues i was just flicking back to the uh, previous four and while page ones have been splashy they have been uh, multi-panel so um it's a it's a it's a return of a single page opening splash to the gi joe page one if only there, there'd also been a, a story, <laughs> a story title in uh, in lettering in bold, you know, big letters, and and maybe and uh, create credits on that page. Uh, I'd be in heaven. And there's space for it with the star, the stars and stripes yeah. motif on the top and bottom. But you know, that's not how comics are are designed these days. So that's okay. <laughs> um, going going back to this critique of uh, Mooneyham tending to draw straight on with one point perspective and avoiding two point linear perspective and three point linear perspective. Hey, this splash page on page one of issue three of five is in three point perspective. If you look at the up and down lines of all this air conditioning stuff, you can see that it starts to like make a triangle that converges down like two feet below the bottom of the page. Anyway, um, so you know, this is the <laughs> kind of we've page. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight characters on this page, all full figure, um, seeing uh, seeing you know an awful lot of their their outfits and and uh, not a uh, not a single close up in sight on this page. <laughs> yeah, um, be, because because I nitpick. All right, here's my here's my nitpick. Uh, I want to see some red on that viper in the middle. Mm. I love I love the eighty six viper color combination the black vest, the red ribbing and details, the blue cloth. And uh, certainly there have been some action figure variations over the years where there's a Viper that's just all blue and a different kind of blue. So maybe it's that guy. Uh, the, what, the Toys R Us 3-pack from yeah, it's, it's Yeah, it's curious that they've gone for this, you know, all blue color on, on there. And you wonder to what extent it's a a proactive design choice. I think there, I don't, I'm not trying to read the mind of the, the talented Francesco Sagala, but I think there may be with a book as complicated as GI Joe, there are all these bits to color um, in the same way that an artist may slightly simplify a costume, putting something in shadow, leaving out a few details, you know, a, like three straps become one strap or a bunch of ribbing just becomes a, you know, a little bit of pants on the leg. 
Um, I think there is sometimes a a color decision to color the, I don't mean bright and dark highlights. I mean the sort of vital highlights and leave out some of the details. And there is a desaturated approach to all of these colors, right? These these blues are not like bright, bright, emerald blue. They're they're a little, they've got a little gray in them. They've got a little red. They've got a little brown in them. You know, there's a little beige. This, if you squint, this page is all kind of blue beigey. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, maybe, anyway, it's a neat first page. And uh, <laughs> I'm struck on the next two pages by the shape of the eye slits in Cobra Commander's new mask. Hmm. The the sort of cat's eye. I think that's the, I think if, if you're wearing, if a, if a person's wearing glasses when they're shaped like this, I think that's how you describe them. Or a comic person might describe them as Spider-Man eyes, or <laughs> possibly possibly Catwoman eyes, depending on the on the. Um, and I'm struck by what a n- neat little detail that Mooneyham puts in here to a make this Cobra Commander look more nefarious, mm. as opposed to the sort of r- regular shape of the eye slits of the old hooded costume. You, you know, again, thinking back to Ron Wagner's cover to GI Joe number one hundred. You know, Cobra Commander on that cover doesn't of 100 doesn't look particularly evil. He's not like frowning and leaning forward and there's all these shadows on his eyes and his eye slits are sort of echoing the evil quality. It's just, but here, this Cobra Commander looks, uh, he looks intimidating. Yeah, it's almost got kind of the squiggle of, of if you were to draw a cartoon villain, that sort of the, the squiggle of an evil eyebrow. It's almost taking that shape to some degree, isn't it? And uh, yeah, so they're, they're in the beginning of the story, we're opening with uh, an investigation as to those disintegrated vipers that Dawn had encountered in the, the previous issue. And they're sort of putting together the, you know, figuring out exactly what had happened via the, you know, what's been left behind on those smoldering embers and, and the video footage and the, the, the scraps that they're finding and they're seeing the, the shadows that, that Cobra Commander can spot the silhouette of the shadows of, as being Cobra Vipers. And uh, <laughs> I kind of, I laughed to myself, but then no prized it because the Televiper says that he corrects Cobra Commander from who's looking at the shadows. He says, those are Cobra Vipers, modified Cobra Vipers. Looks like they're altered with revanche technology. And I thought to myself, hey, you can tell that from a shadow? That's very clever. But um, I guess... The no plies there is is that actually he's putting two and two together the the pieces the remnants that have been left behind in conjunction with the the shadows on the on the image and I guess also the the surveillance footage of Cobra Island that they're able to to put all those pieces together and and you know realize that they're dealing with these modified Cobra Vipers altered with ranch technology snooping about on their rooftops and of course. It means Serpent or Khan and uh, that tooth yanker, Dr. Mindbender. On these two pages, I'm struck by these three pages, all the forensic work. That, mm. That's fun. This is not a conversation I feel like we've seen Larry Hama's Cobra Commander have before or in a long time. And it, it just feels different the way that mm. he's feeling defensive of Springfield. Uh, and I'm really struck by on pages two and three the sort of book ending of the close-up panel of Cover Commander with the white background and the close-up of Cover Commander with the red background, where colorist Francesco Sagala feels very confident in working with a limited palette. And mm. G.I. Joe Comics at IDW didn't have this approach. And and there's there's several things going on here. It's, it is the desaturated palette. You know, these are not like bright, reflective blues. All the blues don't look like satin and silk. There are textures. You know, if you look at the sky in uh, the big panel on page three, where you can see the Springfield Community Center, but just tiny silhouettes on the roof, that sky, I don't mean the black ink of the texture. I mean the the actual sort of ink wash of the sort of grayish night sky. But then... You know, and and this has happened a couple times in each issue where a panel just has a bright white background when someone is reacting. You know, when mm. when Duke and Wild Bill are trying to you know pull up on the uh, yoke of the airplane, or 
whatever it is. And it is a it is a classic and highly effective device. You know, white for surprise, red for anger, uh, sometimes yellow for surprise, and uh, it's it's both neat and it also adds some real variety to the pages. And one of my comments on the colors in the IDW run was scenes tended to sort of, in terms of color scripting, run together because the the approach was was almost always the same for every scene. And then there's something subtle, which I've referred to in previous issues that Sagala keeps doing in this issue, where he tends to use a certain color cast depending on where we are. So you turn to page four and uh, Dawn's in an attic and the boxes and the rafters around her are slightly warm. There's a little bit of red in that sort of pale gray uh, color. And then below her, back in the pit, Duke, although he's illuminated by this giant screen, that he, this table, the, the cast for that scene in the background is, is purple. And so on this page, you have this color. And then on the next page, right, the exterior of Dawn's house, what's the color cast? It's aqua. The van is aqua. The, the houses, the grass, the bushes have some aqua. In that middle panel where we see Dawn looking out the window and her reflection, great panel aqua it is a desaturated sort of faded aqua right and then on that panel at the bottom of page five where the crimson guardsman is at the door and dawn's parents are in the door it's really subtle but what's the color inside their house it's a yellow right so you have these colors that reinforce scene changes which is great yeah, I'll just I'll just sort of rewind slightly to to something that that you touched on um, when you were talking about Cobra Commander and and sort of this this putting together of the the piece where he's being quite hands on in in looking at you know what's happened on the roof of the Springfield Community Center here and just across these five issues Cobra Commander is being presented as being a lot more of a lot more of a lot of things you know he he's more by, directly sort of violence in, in terms of t- shooting Wade Collins uh, in 301 and, and then making the escape from the, the Joes and just more calculated, um, more of a leader in terms of you know, the, the couple of rallies that he's been having uh, with the, the large audiences and a bit more sort of clued together about sort of the defence that he's leading on and, and then this investigation here is just sort of a bit more, uh, you know, clever, shrewd. Um, he, he's being presented as a, a lot more of a sort of a credible leader and threat, and less of the kind of the cartoon silliness of Cobra Commander that that we have seen a fair amount of before in the towards the tale of uh, IDW. As a contrast, one of my notes for this issue is, although Duke and the couple of Joes with him in the pit are directing other Joes and making decisions. And although uh, Dr. Mindbender and Sir Pentacon are directing other people and watching, you know, remote video and making decisions, there is a little passivity now, two or three issues in a row, where, you know, Duke sure is just standing around at base a lot. <laughs> yes. And Dr. Mindbender and Sir Pentacon are just standing around at base a lot. And... I certainly understand in in military and paramilitary hierarchies, you have someone back at base making decisions and then you, you know, you cut to like, uh, you know, a a robot hand attacking some Joes and then someone shoots it and, and, uh, or, you know, some Joes grab the three zombie vipers and there's a, there's a, a sort of punch of action and activity. So I understand the logic behind it, but my two comments would be, you know, I don't want these favorite characters who are really smart and exciting to be standing in front of monitors making decisions for too many more issues before they do something. And also, the doing something could be pretty small. I don't need necessarily Duke to go on a mission into the field, and I certainly think we'll see Sir Pentacon in the field soon. But, you know, they could be sort of walking through the room, pushing buttons, flipping through paperwork in a folder and a clipboard handing a tablet to an underling you know i think about um when i when i got out of college um i worked on a tv show 
And every episode had sort of the main kid talking with a teacher. And uh, this was an animated show. And the scenes were really funny because the actors were great and the voices were interesting and the writing was great. But the director sort of pointed out that it's like, well, we can't have like a two minute scene every episode where these two characters just like sit uh, like outside of school on the soccer field and just like talk. They have to be doing something, give them something to do. And uh, I remember one episode, uh, one of the animators was showing a storyboard for one of these scenes. And uh, one of the characters is like fiddling with something. And the animator said, I'm having him peeling an orange. And I thought, well, that doesn't have anything to do with the scene. The scene isn't about like fruit or nutrition or like sweets or grocery shopping. Um, they're not hungry. It's just like a prop that doesn't really distract. And it's like sometimes sometimes when I'm reading a comic or when I'm watching a, a TV show and it's just a bunch of talking heads, I think, man, I wish someone were peeling an orange. And <laughs> um, And, you know, there could be, again, a bunch of things like, you know, and certainly Stalker does do something, right? He leaves that scene and he does something. But I I, I feel like the, the Serpentercon and Dr. Mindbender talking back and forth to each other about what's happening and what they're going to do next. I want, I want a prop. I want some visual interest. I want them like walking down a hallway or going through a doorway or, you know, like Dr. Mindbender, like picking at a weird boil because he's a zombie. <sighs> yeah, nasty. You know, and it's and it's sort of like, they're zombies, right? Like that hasn't come up. Yeah, not they're not, not acting. They're not, not, not acting much. like zombies. So yeah, they sort of uh, the the bit that they're emphasizing is is that they're not out, acting like zombies too much most of the time. Well done for for holding it back. I, I, mm. Your example sort of put me in mind a little bit of um, Watchmen when Raw Shark is is turning up at the Night Owl's house and he sits out there at this kitchen table and he's eating cold baked beans out of a a can and you know it's not it's not essential to the plot or anything but it's just he's doing something and and at the same time he's it's it's this kind of thing that's talking to him as a as a character and his you know his traits and, and give and and while that bit isn't necessarily advancing the plot it, it sort of it's informing the type of you know character that he is and making for a an interesting visual yeah uh, you know this the other thing that this reminds me of is uh, a lot of really great dialogue over 10 years at Marvel Comics reading various Brian Michael Bendis written Avengers, Daredevil, or Spider-Man comics. Great dialogue. Sometimes I'm aware, it's like, all right, this is like the third page in a row of two characters having a conversation and the dialogue's really snappy. I'm like, what are they doing? A lot of talking heads in that era. Yeah, someone standing at the window looking outside Avengers Tower or Stark Tower and someone else is behind them sitting and it's it's witty. But, you know, could someone be fixing some Iron Man armor? You know, <laughs> or could someone be like flipping through a manila folder because they're about to go on a mission and, and they're they're uh, they're briefing themselves anyway. OK, so back to the issue. I want to call out something really subtle that I don't think I noticed in previous issues. If you look at page four. The big panel on the bottom. Oh, hey, it's it's a straight on one point perspective shot looking at uh, a couple of Joes. Um, I think I think it's allowable. They're looking into the monitor. So we're kind of seeing them from the, almost the monitor's POV. Uh, I, I do think it's allowed. I uh, This issue does have a couple of three point perspective panels, which I don't think I have seen much of um, in Mooneyham's G.I. Joe. Uh, and the one point straight on shots. Uh, there's, there's just a few of them. It's not, it's not past my, like, uh, you know, like red alert too many, um, uh, limitation. Um, uh, but I, I do notice them. Um, but this panel, when Duke says, obviously you emerged victorious from that encounter, look at that word balloon and then look at the one below it. You were able to collect, were you able to collect any Intel? These ellipses, these ovals in Pratt Brousseau's lettering are not perfectly symmetrical. I think he might be drawing them by hand in the computer, maybe tracing on top of a perfectly drawn ellipse. And it's subtle, it's great, because it is slightly irregular. And in the era of perfect computer lettering and perfect computer word balloons, 
and perfect straight lines for uh, panel borders, or if an artist is using a certain tool in the computer, just any perfect straight line, you know, for a, a brick or a building or a, whatever it is, this little bit of irregularity adds back in the, the, the human touch that this was made by hand, even with digital tools. And the, the like too perfect, too clean, too crisp thing of comics in the last 20 or 30 years, anything that sort of pushes back against it, I find delightful. Very good. So this is the sequence in Dawn's uh, house where she's up in the attic or loft and uh you know reporting back to the pit and then she's able to spy this fred series neighbor who looks like he's got brown hair but you know i'm not going to quibble too much about that. I, I am. <laughs> and uh uh and he's you know knocking on the door to to you know ask if dawn might be there get a little bit of credit for making the discovery and uh dawn's parents you know let him in we we're initially a little bit worried, you know, are, are they going to uh, turn on Dawn? But um, of course they, they don't. And they, you know, duff him up and reassure Dawn, uh, let him know that, uh, that they're, they're, you know, they're not going to kill their neighbor, but they'll keep him tied up and then they'll slip out of town tomorrow. Uh, so that, uh, to let Dawn make her way and then, and then they'll uh, follow. And they also give, um, Dawn, uh, a cute nickname as well, uh, say we love you nina this page uh has that two panels before the one you just referred to with the nickname it's an over the shoulder shot we're up on the stairs with dawn looking down past her at her parents and the the fred on the floor and uh uh and and hey it's 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 three point perspective and similarly on the previous page uh when we're looking up at dawn when she's on the landing looking down uh, it's the panel under her parents looking at each other when the word balloon says, you didn't mention this to anyone else, did you, Fred? Right, Dawn's got her hands on the railing. Um, we are looking slightly up at her. So I'm seeing a lot more panel variety in the, quote, camera placements. And I don't feel like this issue is sort of stale or limited in its visual storytelling, as was my critique for 301, 302, 303, except for one scene which I will point out in a moment. Um, I do just want to remind everyone, when Wade Collins shows up on the first page of issue 43, he's got red hair. It's it's a light orange. And when uh, Mark Bright drew some Freds around issue oh, 98, 101, some CGs have their helmets off. They've got... Red, you know, I, I say red hair. I mean, I mean light orange, like Irish people. And in the IDW run, or later in the Marvel run, I think all the Freds sort of became blonde, like yellow. And um, here, the Chris Mooneyham inking is suggesting darker hair. Um, but the panel where the Fred is unconscious on the floor. He does seem to have not brown hair, but, you know, light orange hair, red hair. So uh, the jury's still out. But uh, <laughs> my vote for any colorists or editors listening is uh, is to uh, go back to how Wade Collins and his ilk looked uh, at, at, the, at the beginning appearances in the Marvel run. So then next sequence is in the pit where they're doing this forensic examination of one of these cyborgs that they'd taken from uh, Snake Eyes' cabin in the High Sierras and, and had that altercation midair last issue where they realised that they weren't completely inactive, um, but, but they don't seem to have quite learned that lesson because uh, we've got a, uh, a hand which is able to uh, reactivate. So um, I, I had a bit of an eye spy, Tim, which which sort of flummoxed me for a couple of minutes thinking about who is this character um and and it should have been quicker for me because I, I think um i think we've been given enough information that i should have realized who it was but uh, to the right of that cyborg laid out on the table did you immediately realize who that co that character on the right is with the kind of orange looking top and grayish looking 
buckles. That's airtight because he was with these characters in the previous issue, right? Although now that you're saying this, is it Lightfoot? Because he's really got Lightfoot's <laughs> costume. Wait a minute. What's going on? This is it's, my, it's got, my, yeah. It's got to be My airtight. realization was, yes, of course, it's it's airtight, isn't it? That um, he was he was with them in the previous issue. And, you know, it's that same team back together again, mainframe, Black Hat, airtight. They were on the Tomahawk together. So it's, it's the same team, obviously. But the, uh, the color scheme for airtight did throw me ever so slightly. i was like is that is that sky striker the tiger rat pilot what what would he be doing there it it took me a little bit longer than than really it should have to to figure out oh of course it's blooming airtight isn't it i think what might be throwing us off is that airtight's costume is a, a, an orangey yellow and green and here, this guy, all of his chest stuff, the, the, the stuff on top of his yellow-orange jumpsuit, is more of a blue-gray. And yes, that sounds very nitpicky, but, you know, it's a toy line and there's, there's all this variety in it. Uh, and, you know, one small change and it's a different a action figure. I think I was also slightly responding to uh, his receding hairline. Mm -hmm. And of course we don't, I, I know, I don't know about the classified action figure, but in the original figure, his helmet is molded on. But um, when airtight shows up in the fun house, which is a great 1985 episode, he has his helmet off and the way that Russ Heath character designer for the cartoon has designed him, He has a, like Duke, like the original Duke before his like buzz cut. He has a little bit of a receding hairline. Anyway, mm -hmm. Um, okay, so a little bit Norman Osborne, perhaps. Um, yeah, not not with the ridges in the hair, but the actual yeah, yeah. sort of hair pattern. Okay, something that's great on these two panels, and something that uh, I I would like Mooneyham to do differently. All right, so something that's great in the big panel on the left page, with airtight and the other two Joes looking down at this uh, operating table. There's something really subtle which is there are three or four or five black circles around the panel, which are lights that Mooneyham has uh, knocked out in black silhouette. And then uh, Sagala uh, in color has added sort of a white fuzzy halo around them below them. And so this is just a little subtle foreground element that adds some cool depth to this panel, right? So that we get a sense of like, how, how tall is the ceiling? Well, mm -hmm. it's, it's not too tall because here, here are the lights. You know, the, it's not a 50 foot ceiling. It's not a 30 foot ceiling. It's like a 12 foot ceiling, 15 foot ceiling. And uh, in terms of breaking up the space, in terms of compositionally sort of echoing, paralleling the ovals of the word balloons, it's just a nice visual, right? It, it doesn't change the story. It doesn't, doesn't solve any problems. It's just a nice small decision. Okay, that's cool. The actual breaking up on the left page, how Mooneyham is not doing anything like the sort of standard, you know, 1940s through 1980s, like regular rectangular panels, you know, four panels per page, six panels per page, eight or nine panels per page. There's a lot of variety Mooneyham will have some, you know, wide skinny panels and some square inset panels and like a bigger sort of anchor panel. And then the bit on the right page where the actual hand attacks Black Hat and she throws the hand across three panels. That's all very cool. Okay, so I love it. Here's my comment. In the first panel, Stalker is with Duke and Lady J and he says, I'm going to go tell the other team in the other room. And then in that very small second panel, over Duke's shoulder, we see Stalker in a doorway walking away from us. Great. Clear. And then we are in another space uh, with the three Joes looking at the cyborg on the table. And then the hand attacks. And then on the right page, uh, the hand is attacking and uh, Black Hat throws it. And then the hand gets shot. And then there's this big, dramatic two-thirds splash and it's in three-point perspective we are looking we are below stalker we are looking up at him but we're also off axis from him so there are all kinds of diagonals pointing to 
three different vanishing points, on above, on the left, and on the right, way, way, way off the page. Okay, it's a very cool, dramatic, big panel, right? And it's a cool, badass moment for Stalker, both in visual and in dialogue, right? Cool, awesome. Okay, where is Stalker? The the story logic and the the context clues say that he is in the same room as Black Hat Mainframe and Airtight, but I don't actually see where he is. He's in some kind of doorway, but I don't know if he's like five feet from Black Hat, if he's 30 feet from Black Hat. And so as much of a cool factor as there is for this page, because you get this two-thirds splash of a badass character drawn cool doing a badass thing, I really wish the camera pulled back from Stalker five feet or 10 feet, and we could see something of like Black Hat's shoulder or the operating table, or like if you pull back even further, like all three Joes and the operating table in the foreground and Stalker, and you'd see more of his body in this doorway. And I showed this to someone before we recorded and they said, oh, he's not in the same room? Are they not all in the same room? I said, no, he left and went to a different room. And so it's clear from context and from some of the visual storytelling, I do think it could be a lot clearer. And that's part of why I've been picking on this, like Mooneyham, a lot of close-ups, a lot of straight-on shots. There's, I, I feel like there could be more clarity in where his characters are in a space, in, in a room or in an exterior, compared to other characters. Mm. And there's there's a little bit of blurring of this sequence in the in the pit because the first two panels are in that that kind of ops room, Stalker, Lady J, Duke all together, and then the next sequence is the the sort of three Joes doing the forensics post mortem on this cyborg. And as we kind of transition between scenes, we've got the two speech bubbles that bump up against each other. That there's Duke talking in the in the first room in the first room overlapping then with the speech bubble from mainframe. So. I kind of had to stop and concentrate a little bit to to realize that we're kind of moving from one room to another between these two two sequences. So this is a case where Francesco Sagala could have changed the color cast to separate these two spaces. I understand that they're all in the pit and maybe the pit wants its own color, but the room with Duke and the room with uh, the the hand, the robot hand, they could be more different from each other. And just to put a final point on this, occasionally in comics, on the last page of a story, you see the artist sign their name uh, or on their final issue of a run or sometimes on like a really cool splash page, they sign their name. And uh, it's it's not my thing, but, you know, they drew it. And if they're the only place their name appears in the comic is like, in typed credits on the inside front cover, I you know the same way that an artist gets to actually sign the cover. Like sure, I, an artist can like sign a, a really exciting splash page. Chris Mooneyham signs this two thirds splash page with Stalker, and it's a cool drawing and it's a cool moment. But I do feel like that's slightly supporting my argument here that this is like. Whether on purpose or not, this is a little bit more about like making a cool piece of art. Like this page is going to sell if it's a if it's a, an original drawn on boards, as opposed to what are the layouts and camera decisions that the story really suggest. And again, I think it's that Stalker is smaller, and we see we see him in more of that room, and that would not be a page that you know, like the artist would want to sign because it's not as sexy. Mm -hmm. um, you made a point as well about the panel layouts, which I just wanted to echo that that we definitely do get a lot of variety in the, the panel layouts that on occasion there'll be a more traditional sort of six panel grid or something along those lines, like the the panel where Fred gets punched in the stomach by um, Dawn Moreno's uh, parents. But for the most part, we're seeing a lot of kind of like half page splashes overlapping panels inset panels and, and a lot of variety i like i like the interesting panel kind of design that they had in the sequence that we were just talking about with stalker shooting that hand that you kind of got 
for portrait style panels of uh of black hats grappling with the handroid and, and throwing it and then it getting shot and, and sort of the the quick succession of the, the the panels sort of indicating that it's all operating within a similar space and we're almost taking like a a sort of microsecond by microsecond kind of snapshot of what's happening as she's grappling with the hand throwing it, it launching through the air and then eventually getting shot there's there is a lot of interesting variety to, to kind of panel layouts that we are getting here from uh, part of Mooneyham. part of why i'm focusing so much on mooney hands sort of quote can it's not a movie it's a comic there's no camera but his quote camera placement is that the gi joe comic book both as a comic that ran in the 80s at marvel when then there, when there was a particular focus on clarity because of editor-in-chief jim shooter visual clarity um, and also because of the Larry Hama connection, that the guy who's written this comic the whole time is a fine storyteller and pencil artist, though he has not done a lot of it that G.I. Joe readers have necessarily seen. And particularly in an unusual step, that same writer has drawn a couple issues. You know, it's not like, you know, like the guy who writes Punisher or the guy who writes X-Men, the guy who writes Batman. Well, maybe that has also drawn some issues. So in G.I. Joe, and also as G.I. Joe, a legacy Marvel book, there is a strong tradition of clear visual storytelling. And in the 90s, as the image artists, as they were starting to strut their stuff at Marvel before they left Marvel, and then really when they get to image, what you see in that those first three years of image books is... Um, a lot of pages and, you know, everyone look at look at Snake Eyes Dead Game. It's like every page is an example of this where half a page ends up kind of being a pinup or like a splash or a cover within a page. And uh, there is less of a focus on the choreography of characters through a space. You know, if they're infiltrating a base, if they're fighting, if they're like traversing a mountain, if they're like going down an elevator and then down a hallway and getting in their tanks. And a lot of like characters standing in cool poses and all those early image comics are a lot of fun, but I think we mostly agree that the art was exciting and the writing was only okay. And that approach influenced all of the other publishers. So Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, other image books that weren't from the image founders started to have this imprint of Less of the like Rod Wiggum, you know, G.I. Joe issue 40 something, like six or eight rectangular panels where characters aren't like posing in awesome, like flashy Spider-Man spawn poses, They're just like standing and shooting and punching and running. So here and there where Mooneyham's art gets a little more like pinuppy and a little less uh, like the nuts and bolts of the moment to moment beat to beat panel to panel continuity i think like no 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 gi joe's not that book it's it's the storytelling book talking about clarity that kind of leads me on to the next sequence there where we're in the quonset hut with the three vipers and three joes and it's it's quite a different cool sequence in that it's it's kind of very frenetic up close physical kind of grappling and, and jeopardy the, the likes of we don't necessarily get a huge amount of all, of all the time particularly in non-ninja characters and and i do like the sequence but there was a moment of clarity that sort of slightly confused me which i kind of again have to go back on just to make sure that i'm following it correctly i think it's caused by two vipers being kind of identical designs involved in this battle at the same time and what happens is that Lady J is fighting against one of them and Spirit is fighting against the other and Spirit elbows one of them in, in its visor and smashes the visor. Um, and at the same time, Lady J is fighting with hers and, and he's also got a smashed visor perhaps from a headbutt. So we've got kind of two vipers with visors smashed in this sequence simultaneously who I think are different characters, but it, it sort of slightly makes for a more confusing interaction uh, funny enough though spirit's not the first time he's been involved in smashing a viper's visor there's a very cool panel 
back around uh, issue 100 ish in Millville, where he uh, <laughs> pulls a, vi- uh, a viper by uh, some straps against the, the the roof of a hiss and, and smashes its, its visor, which is a particularly satisfying panel. I think part of the storytelling um, v- vagueness around these two Joes and these two vipers you're pointing to is that the actual page with the elbow to the visor and the headbutt all the backgrounds drop out and on the previous page halfway through the backgrounds drop out and this is a complicated scene because it takes place both on ground level inside the quonset hut and also one floor down in the base on uh-huh. the sort of top level uh-huh. underground of the base. But also, if you look at the page opposite the elbow smash and the headbutt, where Spirit is, um, what is that, a half Nelson, a full Nelson? Where he's <laughs> sort of, it's a cool sort of gra- grabbing the Viper. He's in the ladder shoot. And the panel, and then the panel to the left, Molto is coming out of the ladder shoot up onto ground level with his machete. And the panel below the half Nelson, Lady J is on the ground on the top underground level, uh, wrestling with the Viper for the for the grenade. And so yeah. there are there are three good guys, three bad guys, one key prop, the grenade. Two of the good two of the bad guys look the same. Then they have this similar sort of quote injury, and it's in three distinct places. Like topside in a Quonset hut, in a narrow ladder chute, and then on the top underground floor. And um yeah, let's so let's break it break it down. I guess they're in the, the three of the three vipers are in the Quonset hut initially. The blanket rises up, I guess, sort of you know, implying that that there's a Joe underneath it, and he, uh, one of the vipers, has disappeared. So spirit has taken the rear viper down, mm-hmm. li- literally down, literally down, and then they go look at the vi- blanket again, and they lift it up, and there's a a ladder shoot and then a, a hand comes up to grasp the second viper who's still up in the the room and the, the gloved hand is lady J, and so she, she says come here you although molto has the same glove true true <laughs> uh he's got gray gloves as opposed to her kind of more brown oh okay yeah red gloves and then molto arises from the ladder shaft uh holding machete to fight the final viper uh, who's the more sort of side you know revanchy looking viper it within the Kwanzaa hut and so then spirit is grappling with his first viper that he had grabbed lady j is grappling with the second viper that she had grabbed and he's the one with the the, the grenade and pulling it uh, the, the pin so spirit takes out his visor his his no, t- no. spirit takes out his viper by the looks of things and then goes to help wait, uh, wait lady go back j a step. with hers when when Molto takes out the robot with the machete, there is no background, but they're still up in the Quonset hut. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And then, as you were saying, Spirit takes out the visor. Yeah. And, and so I think his elbow to the face of that, that Viper is taking it out, freeing him up to then help Lady J. So presumably that Viper is still alive and will be their, their living prisoner to interrogate. And then they've got the uh, another Viper with a broken visor with the sort of the zombie looking face underneath and he gets a, a fa- yeah fairly brutal marvel zombie style <laughs> shot to the head <laughs> from lady j to to take him out and then this element of multo chopping off his hand to to regain that pin which has been frozen into place um so i had yeah. a thought which we've not done this for a little while but this sequence really for me is a bit of a a hammer time hammerism. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop! Hammer time. And that is this this real kind of choreography um, and focus on this very specific technical detail about the grenade pin and the grenade spoon as to how they are sort of uh, functioning as kind of mechanical components of this weapon. Yeah, and it starts two pages earlier when the viper says. Uh, we'll have to check them again. Irk, getting this pin back in is a pain, right? He, he's, that Viper is letting us know right. that the, 
Um, this scene has both Chekhov's grenade and also Chekhov's machete. <laughs> because in a straight on shot with one point perspective, uh, Spirit and Lady J and Molto are walking down a hallway at us. Molto has his machete. And I thought, oh, I don't remember what um, Molto's uh, particular weapons are. Cool. I guess he has a giant knife. I wonder if he's going to use that. And then a couple panels below, this Viper is like, hey, Tim, I'm doing something very specific with a grenade. I'm disarming it. I'm putting it back into inactivity. And I thought, I think someone's going to mention this grenade again, this issue, (laughs) right? It's like, well, it's not on the cover to the next issue. So I bet it's wrapped up in this issue. And then the grenade doesn't go off. But they spend two pages worrying about it and talking about it, mm-hmm. uh, two and a half pages. And yeah. the machete does, quote, go off. And this scene is also, so it's it's both that thing you just said where Larry Hama is being very specific about a very specific kind of material. You know, like I, <laughs> there was an Army Navy surplus store in my town growing up. And my brother and I each bought when we were, you know, like sixth and ninth grade, uh, a, a grenade, a, a disarmed army surplus grenade. And it's heavy and it's got a pin. And I'd never pulled the pin out, but I've started to tug it a few times. <laughs> and that's a different kind of grenade than the one in this scene. But something that like I didn't quite realize when I saw uh, Big Lob use a grenade in the animated G.I. Joe the movie and, you know, like military shows and movies as a kid. Pulling the pin of a grenade, it's not like it's not like a hot knife through butter. Mm. There's there's some friction. There's some tension, you know? It's like dragging a little piece of metal. Anyway, and um, so here's a very different kind of grenade. And so, okay, so Hama's actually pointing out to all of us this very specific material works in a very specific way. You know, it's like in some comics or movies, someone just reloads their weapon, their their pistol, right? And in a Larry Hama G.I. Joe comic, someone might say something like, oh, the so-and-so's jammed, or like, no, the so-and-so clip doesn't fit in the so-and-so pistol. I need the different so-and-so clip, right? Like, no, throw me your other clip. That's the five, not the six, right? Like Hama's thinking about that. Okay, and then, so it's the actual material. And then it's the it's the specific concern of what happens when this weapon goes off, right? Because it's a, what kind of grenade is it? It's a nerve gas ordinance. I had an observation that it looks a lot like a standard Mark II pineapple style grenade, which was prevalent during World War II. But uh, yeah, the, the MacGuffin is that it's got nerve gas in it. So Hama may have provided an image for Mooneyham. Mooneyham may have Googled something on his own. Hama may be sort of inventing or exaggerating a specific weapon. Mooneyham may be exaggerating or inventing a specific look. But when G.I. Joe Comics and also The Nom, which was a Marvel book that Larry Hama was the consulting editor on, have occasionally referred to chemical weapons like Agent Orange or White Phosphorus, it's it is a thing to be avoided and <laughs> yeah. and in this gi joe series a zombie bomb already went off and airtight is already in this issue in a different scene although very close by and so you know this kind of this kind of grenade weapon has a different resonance than quote just a machine gun or a missile or a rocket from a plane or a, a, a pistol and so there's there's sort of there's a different level of worry. And so even though I found on that page with the elbow and the headbutt, even though I found Spirit's dialogue, not if I clamp my hands around yours to prevent the spoon flying, I felt like that was a little overwritten for my benefit. Um, I feel like Spirit clamping his hands around the Viper's hand would, you know, would could visually sell that idea without. Um, Because in the moment, you wouldn't say it. You know, it's like, uh, you know, Mark, as we podcast, make sure that your face is three inches and 45 degrees from your microphone and your headphones are plugged in. It's like, no, 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 we're we're doing a podcast, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because it's it's a sequence designed all about the very technical specifics of how the pin 
and the spoon of this grenade work in combination uh, together and um you know how you know how do you how do you explain it how do you explain that in a succinct way without looking like you're over explaining um but i do think that i do think a little less dialogue here would work or you know okay this this big panel on the bottom of spirit clamping his hands down on the viper's hand and the grenade what if that were two panels what if the first panel were what we're seeing here but um uh, sort of cropped a little bit so that it's it's just just the two heads and their like hands and then we have like a close-up of spirit's hands really tightly holding and a little bit of different dialogue like lady j the spoon hurry you know i feel like you could slightly under explain it in the dialogue and from context we would get it and may maybe the counter is like tim you just got very particular about how many feet stalker is in a doorway from the other <laughs> joes when he fires his gun and here like Hama and Mooneyham are like working extra hard to make it clear. And I feel like I feel like this this sequence here in some ways overdoes it and in some ways slightly underdoes it. Um, and then the third thing that really strikes me about this scene, one, is the like very specific weapon, the m- mechanics of it. Two, the sort of concern about that weapon different than other weapons. And three, this scene is funny. And I think we sometimes forget that Larry Hama like is a funny guy with a sense of humor and he writes funny bits into G.I. Joe. And it's like, how does this scene end, right? With Molto cracking a little bit of a joke as a tension break for the characters <laughs> in the scene and for us. And similarly, when Lady J shows up and shoots the friggin' cyborg uh, <laughs> zombie monster in the in point blank, one, two, three, four, five, six times with a pistol. I think that's Hama like chuckling. Because, <laughs> because yeah, it's he says, "You're not going to unlock my fingers from the pen. We'll see about that." Right, right, right. And in the same way that Stalker, you know, Stalker's line a couple pages earlier mm-hmm. when he shoots the hand, like that line is both a badass Stalker cool thing it's also it's also hama saying like man this is fun i think readers see that line and it's both stalker being cool and also like ha 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 and so you know in the same way that on the next page after the after the pin the grenade scene finishes when mindbender and serpenter khan are talking and uh, is it dickens who who wrote he where he says oh, uh, uh, Serpentel uh, says uh, sign back. He says uh, Serpentel says we all know what happens to the uh, to the best laid plans of mice and men once the first shot is fired, and that is from uh, Robert Burns. The best laid schemes of mice and men. It's you know saying no matter how carefully a project is planned, something may still go wrong with it, uh, and sort of conjo- combining that again with kind of the view that. I guess military plans go out of the window once the first shot is fired in a battle. Right. You know, sometimes you read a story and you get the sense that the writer is showing off. And I don't ever get the sense when I read a Larry Hama G.I. Joe comic that Hama is showing off. I always feel like he's working for it. Like he either did the research on how a particular, you know, it's like, Aim the turrets upwards. Like they're not going to hit us. Like why not? Like we're at we're at an angle where the turrets can't get that high. It's like he's thinking about how the whatever it is, the cobra hiss or the cobra maggot works. And here, when he's dropping in a historical reference, that is what Sir Pentacon would do because he's got all these military minds, or he's Genghis Khan, a great military mind. And Hama is both commenting on, as you just said, things go out the window as soon as a military operation begins. But also you have these, you know, it's like in Star Trek when they quote Shakespeare, you know, like I think nine out of 10 viewers like smile and then, you know, one out of 10 rolls their eyes. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I see. I think a few of the 10 might be oblivious as well. Okay. All right. So four, four of the 10 are like, why are they talking fancy? And then maybe one of the ten is like, why would Klingons have Shakespeare? <laughs> um, how did that get translated? Anyway, so uh, I see throughout this issue, Hama inserting small bits of humor. Mm. And back to the the 
plot. So we've got Mindbender and, and Serpentor observing this going down, that the video feeds have gone dead. Three enhanced Vipers that were dispatched to Recky, the GIGRHQ, have now gone incommunicado. Another... Uh, Recky, Recky short for reconnaissance. Reconnaissance. Or, but or... yeah, incommunicado, another great um, $10 word <laughs> from, from Hammer and, uh, and Mindbender. But Serpentor replies, Excellent, Dr. Mindbender. All is going according to plan. I don't know what that plan is. I don't think Hama does either. I think he's going to make it up when he writes the next issue. Mm-hmm. Or he has a general sense. Uh, yeah, so I wonder what Yeah, uh, if, if <laughs> I wonder what that plan will be. I do not know. Uh, then we've got another sort of different sort of scene all t- together. We've got uh, a return to seeing some of the, <laughs> these... <laughs> And you talk about comedy. This is, I think, the high comedy point of the the issue. Uh, the the sort of pensioner uh, casino playing uh, mutant zombies who are being transformed into an army of uh, cyborgs, and they're lining up lining up for this this treatment. And, and the zombie says, "Is the procedure going to hurt? I mean, hurt a lot more than an ingrown toenail." It will be like having a root canal over your whole body. Oh, I was hoping for kidney stone level. Yeah, so yes, out and out comedy there. But uh, and then we've got uh, a pythonized uh, cobra tr- uh, op- officer who is sort of snooping about and trying. To, they're trying to keep hidden the fact that uh, that Serpentor and Mindbender are trying to put in their own chip to nullify revanche control. And uh, we have a particularly interesting bit of body horror Cthulhuism type here where uh, the the officer has his arm chopped off by one of these kind of uh, laser swords before then kind of growing a whole bunch of gloopy uh, Akira style tendrils, uh, append- tendrils appendages to, to kind of ble- gloop out and uh, crush the, uh, crush the cyborg. So um, I was totally psyched to see someone from Python Patrol I love it when, you know, in during the IDW run, sometimes in an issue, there'd be a bunch of Cobra vehicles. And I don't know that it was Hama calling out three different kinds of Hiss tanks in the plot, but Shannon Gallant would draw three different Hiss tanks or, you know, colorist Jay Brown would color like two of them blue and one of them black. So it's different kinds of Hisses without a, a toy line coming out each year that demands to be promoted in the comic book. You know, in 1989, Python Patrol toys were out. So there's this demand that the comic has to show them. And the TV commercial for the toys... Now I will crush the Joe's Tiger Force! My Python experiment will make Cobra invincible! Python Patrol, Python Patrol, Cobra's on the attack with Python Patrol. Python Patrol, attack! Python Patrol's the evil new foe, but nobody meets G.I. Joe. Python Patrol, vehicles and figures sold separately. Attack! Yo, Joe! And Operation Dragonfire, the episodes in September of 85, go out of their way to explain what Python Patrol is and why and you know hama has to do the same thing and he has uh well more time and space than a 30 second commercial but maybe less time and space than a five-part miniseries and so you know he has dr mindbender invent python patrol in part of an issue and then you can have these vehicles and characters and i love the color scheme of python patrol i love the vehicle choices i love the character choices i love that copperhead goes from being a vehicle driver to being this single pack figure I love that, you know, if you're a kid in 89, you get a chance to own the Cobra Soldier and the Cobra Officer again. Uh, I love that the Televiper is sort of inverted, you know, now there's all this bright colors on it, like yellow, not a, a dark color like blue. So without this sort of demand, there is no reason randomly in 2024 to have a like a Python Patrol story or a Python Patrol appearance. But in the same way that In this very issue on page one, you have both Cobra Troopers and also Cobra Vipers. There is still all this variety in the hierarchy of Cobra and either just for fun or just to add visual differences. 
Or just to make things clearer, when you've got a group of similar looking characters, Hama's got this this like tool in his toolkit. He can throw in not just a Cobra character, but a Python Patrol one. And so I'm very, I'm very excited to see him. And he's a little othered in this scene, right? He's not like a normal Cobra guy. He's he's a he's a he's a subgroup. He's a he's a sub team, right? And I feel like that's that subtly speaks to the fact that he's a, a spy. He's Mindbender and Serpentorcon spy. Mm-hmm. Um, it would also work if he were a non Python uh, officer. Um, so I'm happy to see him. This big two thirds splash page where we cut to Baton Rouge, where uh, remind me, Mark, in a previous issue, was it mentioned that the retired people who had been at the casino in the 290s who get hit by the zombie bomb after uh, 301, did they get on the cruise ship and they they were deposited somewhere? Uh, I don't know how clearly it was spelt out to us, but I guess it was implied in previous sequences that part of you know that that whole Cobra Island contingent would be involved in getting them off Cobra Island and onto the main line, and that that even the pensioners could potentially be part of those those forces. So because they're they're the ones who are going to maybe attack Springfield. Yeah, I feel like the, okay, the way so, of, like, just building out his his army further beyond just the Cobra troops that have. Will on the island. All right. So in the previous issue, that's where Alpha Zero Zero One demoed this sort of hmm. Jack Kirby metal container that would transform a regular zombie into like an enhanced sort of Cobra hmm. revenge zombie, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So now we're in this this factory, this lab, and Mooneyham draws a really cool space. If you sort of look past the three word balloons that the Python officer are saying, you can see that there's sort of a, um, a spherical, it's like we're inside the Epcot dome. Yeah. The geodesic dome. And there's a, an assembly line on the left where a bunch of sort of souped up, I guess, cyborg vipers are, you know, moving down a, a conveyor belt as a, like a robot arm, I don't know, zaps them or does some finishing touches on the right side. There are, at least five of these like Jack Kirby uh, sort of column cocoon machines where you like get into this little rounded coffin as a zombie and you come out as this enhanced Serpentor Khan soldier. I, I do note that this is a straight on one point perspective uh, panel, but it is a very cool depiction of a big uh, space. This is sort of what I wish uh, on the previous page when we see Mindbender and Serpentor Khan in sort of a nebulous control room back at the casino. But we have seen some of that space in previous issues. I do think as cool as this giant two-thirds splash is of the lab assembly line in Baton Rouge for how big Mooneyham makes it and how many cool sort of mechanical assembly line details he packs into it, I do feel like we sort of lose the visual thread of a zombies because they're so small on this page and they're barely on the next page and they're like in the background and not drawn very detailed and b that these zombies like just five issues ago were like regular tourists who were just at a resort at a beach resort and so there's this very big person who's talking to the the tone the toenail root canal, kidney stone joke. This very big person who's talking to this Python officer who's got maybe one normal arm and one sort of, you know, octopus tendril mutated arm. And I think they have a lay around their neck, the uh, the necklace of flowers. I thought it might be the same big zombie who was on page, or maybe not, it's different enough, but there was a uh, a zombie on the first page of 302 that we called out as looking quite close to the mutant leader and they had kind of like a bit of a lay of ears oh the the mutant leader from dark knight Returns. yeah right. and so i wondered if it was the same character as as that but okay perhaps not so, perhaps not it could it could just be a, a lay of, of flowers but uh, too far away to tell for sure yeah so okay so on the one hand i love this big panel because mooneyham is showing this awesome giant mechanical space and i keep saying 
uh, here and there. I wish Mooneyham would pull the camera back and show more of the room in Cobra headquarters, in the pit, in the uh, casino, Cobra headquarters. And here he does. And now I'm, it's like, well, I also want him to move in <laughs> because, the, because what does this panel want to show? It wants to show all the mechanical works and it wants to show that there's a line of these tourists who are now zombies who are getting turned one at a time into these upgraded things. And I feel like if you push the camera in, you know, 10 feet, if you lost like the top sort of inch of this panel, you'd still get a sense of the bigness of the space. You'd still see all the mechanical stuff, but we'd be closer to the people. And you know what happens on the next two panels? The the retired person, the big retired person with the leg keeps talking and the camera is is not on them. It's on the approaching guard, which is also an important uh, story element. Um, so I like this scene. I feel like since we haven't seen any of the casino vacationers turned into zombies in this issue. And, you know, if you're reading it in a graphic novel, it won't matter. Um, but I feel like sort of as a monthly book, the visual reintroduction of the zombie tourists needed to be a little clearer, a little closer here. Mm. Okay. And then... The final sequence is in Destro's castle, sort of uh, with uh, the reintroduction of Zartan in two ways. Firstly, as a simulcrum, and then, then secondly, as the real Zartan on his swamp skier in a swamp somewhere being chased down by a missile. And this sequence feeling very familiar because I've seen a preview uh, image of 306. Uh, where I know that this this sequence continues on with the the missile uh, chasing down Zartan, so it was both new and familiar. For, for, ironically, familiarity being from the next issue. Um, Mark, can you remind us in the previous issue, Destro and the Baroness get reintroduced in just a page or two? I think it is just the very last page of three oh four as a uh, sort. Of segue to, to what is to come in the next issue we have uh in scotland a similar sort of opening panel of uh, of a castle and uh it's um, destro sort of sat on a throne with the baroness by his side and uh, yeah the introduction of zartan so it's a uh, very much a continuation of of that uh, okay sequence. so then here's another mark i don't remember every issue question when did we last see Zartan? I believe it was at the end of Snake Hunt, where he was sort of helping the Joes with his team of Dreadnoughts. And uh, then after causing a whole bunch of carnage and confusion and disarray, everyone else, everyone left Springfield, uh, Destro, Zartan and the Joes. And I think that was the, and I think that was, yes, it was that 275. All right, so that's 30 issues ago. And this is funny because I remember when I was just starting to read the G.I. Joe comic, I got into it in 89, 1989, and issue 90 is my first issue. And, you know, a year or two goes by and I love the book. And because it was only monthly and there's so many characters, sometimes a character would not be in the book for five issues or 10 issues or sometimes there'd be a subplot like the people on the uh the landlocked freighter that's been buried or millville spirit and mutt where hama comes back to it 10 30 issues later and he, it is it has happened once again you know I, I feel like in a very broad sense zartan's motivation in the larry hama gi joe comic is not what it once was because the the hardmaster, sobmaster, snake eyes, cover commander, revenge, swordmaster uh, mission. I think that's all sort of been taken care of. You know, like mm, yeah. did, did Zartan in two seventy five? Is there a scene where one of the Joes says like you can leave, or he does Zartan say like I'm leaving? Don't try and stop me. And so. Uh, I'm, I'm asking because I don't quite remember. But 
to I have been interested, like, where, where is Zartan? You know, similarly with Destro, like, um, I am interested in now that Destro and the Baroness are back, you know, like the last time we saw them, uh, it was, you know, late in the IDW 15 year run, but Destro and the Baroness were concerned about revanche. I don't remember anything more specific than that. And, and so I am looking forward to, in a general sense, Hama having another key character to sort of set up in the two-way or three-way or four-way conflict of, you know, Joe versus Cobra or part of Cobra versus another part of Cobra. And also, what's Destro doing? Is, you know, is Destro mad at Cobra Commander for the most recent assassination attempt, most recent being a couple years ago? And sort of what what the what the motivation will be and what the stakes will be. Because we've got a clear division between Cobra Commander and Springfield and Mindbender and Serpenter Khan and the Cobra Island people. And we have this X factor in Zartan, which may also mean Dreadnoughts. And we have this X factor in Destro and the Baroness, mm. which may mean Iron Grenadiers, maybe not. And now they have an alliance. Except, except, here's the twist. Uh, this Zartan is not the real Zartan. He's a... Uh, to use what well, to use to use a term from the cartoon he's a synthoid he's not technically <laughs> a synthoid uh he he's a perfect double and uh serpentricon and mindbender can see out of his eyes and can hear what he's hearing and so they have inserted this sleeper agent and this is one of those larry hama things where we haven't seen we haven't seen zartan in 30 issues and Literally, the first thing we see of him in more than two and a half years, in three and a half years of real real time, it's not the real Zartan. Mm. And then you turn the page, and it's the real Zartan. And so now my gears start turning. Like, okay, is the real Zartan going to, A, go find the Dreadnoughts, B, go find the Joes, C, Go find Destro and the Baroness. Like, I think there's a fake me talking to you. There he is. <laughs> is the real Zartan going to track this back to Serpentricon and Mindbender? And he's going to head to Cobra Island? Is he going to call Cobra Commander and say, what's going on? Cobra Commander is going to say, I'm too busy. There's a guy. Uh, so I love it. Yeah. I think they're making an enemy of Zartan where where they didn't previously have, have an enemy. But um, mm. it, it is a bit. this is a bit of a callback to issue 303, where they originally have this demonstration of the uh, Garland uh, surgical bots that we see again in the uh, previous scene. And Serpentor asks, by the way, can you fabricate a lifelike shell so that the altered vipers can pass for human? So, so this is, I guess, where that th- particular thread uh, has has led that they've created a simulacrum that uh, can pass not just for human, but can pass for a zartan. Uh, yeah, and and the the other thought is that in the um in the letters page, the editor notes that there's a three-way conflict between the Joes, Serpentor, and Cobra Commander. But I'd say that there's at least five ways, probably six, with uh, Destro, Revanche, and also Zartan being introduced into the mix as well. A final high-level thought that I forgot to mention earlier was just about, and it kind of aligns to the thought that you had talking about uh, big potential special projects that might be worked on, is that there's, uh, we're seeing this definite continuation from um, Hammer of trying to use his new characters that he's been he's introduced. So uh, Black Hat and Multo introduced towards the back end of uh, his run at IDW, very much continuing to play a significant role in the new issues. I do wonder how long it will take before we get to see uh, the likes of Sherlock again. Yeah, who we haven't seen since the cover to 301. Was she in that scene where some Joes were asking about Wade Collins' um Oh, yes. She funeral? might have been in the background there. Yes, true. There was a few of the new Joes in that sequence where where Stalker was explaining the, the history of um, Wade Collins. Good good recall there, Tim. Um, uh, I also just want to point out that um, Chris Mooneyham draws a great Zartan. Mm. It sort of gets sort of gets the the right balance for me that um, 
you know, the, the cloth of his uh, cowl and the sort of elegant simplicity of his uh, of his of his costume, the the makeup on his face, but also the shadows, mm. which sort of enhance it. You know, whereas um, Mooneyham is exaggerating and changing some of the basic stuff like a viper costume, you know, like sh- shoulder pads or, you know, like the, some of the like revanche sort of robot characters are all invented. Um, this, this looks like, you know, classic Zartan. And, uh, and I like that. And this probably is the first time that we've seen a swamp skier in the Harmer written, uh, era since probably it was first introduced back in, uh, the, the, you know, issue 20s or whenever it was it first showed up. Yes, readers, uh, tell us we're wrong if we uh, are forgetting it from a uh, uh, one particular scene in an IDW issue. Um, and then the letters page is, once again, four whole pages. And uh, I know in the internet era, you know, people are just blogging on their own about a comic or talking to other people on uh, Facebook or uh, a discussion board and maybe not sending in an email to a letters page. Uh, I doubt, I doubt many people are sending paper mail because the post box, the pit here doesn't even have a paper mailing address. It just <laughs> has the email address. That's totally reasonable. I love the, the sense that it's not just me that is excited about this comic. It's these other five or six people who the editor has picked their, correspondence to reproduce and there's a little bit of a variety in the letters it's all positive uh i'm surprised and pleasantly surprised you know i sort of keep waiting for someone just because you know it's the world and there's a lot of variety someone to say like well i like this better from five years ago or you know this new run is good but it's not quite doing uh what i want so i'm i'm sort of delighted that you know, the letters, they're all, it's a, it's a variety of people who are fans all the way from the beginning, fans from maybe the middle of the Marvel run, fans from more recently. People are excited about Hama. People are excited that Hama's doing good work. People are excited about Mooneyham. Uh, two people are, are questioning about reprints. One person gets really specific and the answer is sort of properly vague. It's like, we know, we're, we're thinking about it. Uh, actually, I guess three of the letters ask about reprints. Um, letter writer Gene Kendall says something great about uh, color artist uh, Francesco Sagala. Says the colors have retro elements, but that wouldn't seem to be the appropriate word. More accurately, the colorist appreciates the new unique textures that classic comics coloring techniques provide and embraces them with no shame. So many comics today suffer from inappropriate color palettes. Why is everything blue and purple now? Or generic colors with no depth, texture, or personality. Francesco Sagala's work is still modern, but manages to also embrace what worked so well for so many decades. I agree. I also think the the comment about blue and purple, I think this letter writer is referring to uh, this very popular style from the last 10 years uh, that I, I think like two colorists at Marvel really, really pushed and a lot of people followed along where foreground elements are knocked out in purple and uh if if you're wondering what i mean uh just uh just look at the cover to uh marvel comics blood hunt number two where there are some avengers on a uh, on a roof ledge and um the way that they pop is that the buildings behind them are like orange and red and then all of the vampires coming up at them on the bottom are knocked out in uh, light purple. I think that might be what this letterer uh, is referring to. The other theme that I noticed from the um, from the letters is that that we're getting a lot of returning readers who've who've you know lapsed potentially for quite some time and are coming back, sort of attracted by the the relaunch at, at Skybound, which is obviously very much what they they were hoping for. And but the the other thing is there was a lot of letters still being run from uh, three hundred one. So I guess, yeah. guess in terms of like the volume of uh, let, letters coming in for uh, 301 as the first issue, probably much higher than than other issues. So trying to want to touch on those and represent some of those different voices and uh, opinions. But but also, I guess, as in terms of editorial, 
it, it must be easier to just grab some of those ones that you've got in first and, and sort of space those out because uh, you can get ahead of yourselves a little bit more. But um, uh, hopefully we'll get some uh, uh, more content related to the, the more recent issues in, in subsequent uh, issues. Yeah, I think I think there was yet one more letter which said sort of lightly, uh, I, I didn't like the book at IDW. Or, I didn't like the book as much at IDW, and this is a real improvement. It's a Larry Hammer colloquialism. He's talking G.I. Joe and all its heroism. Can you guess what it is? Is it something new? Now listen as Larry drops a slice of real life on you. Before we wrap up, I had a couple of colloquialisms. We talked about it quite a lot, Quonset huts. But what is a Quonset hut? It is a lightweight, prefabricated structure of corrugated galvanized steel with a semi-cylindrical cross-section. Uh, the first Quonset huts were made in 1941 for the U.S. Navy. They needed a building that could be used for many different purposes. At the same time, it had to be light and easy to ship. It had to be possible to put it together without skilled workers. The word Quonset is derived from an Algonquin word which roughly translates to small, long place. There was a, a nice use of the word acetylochloronistic case blockers in the, in the sequence with the, uh, with the Vipers, where he says, even with my helmet integrity compromised, my mods will allow me to survive the release of the acetylia consequenta blockers. Um, say that with a mid-battle, please. Um, so I think what he's saying is that, uh, that this, the nerve gas would be having these impacts on on the, the Joes, um, you know, stop perhaps, I guess, stopping the blood cells from transmitting signals around their body, whatever the science is, uh, and and uh, that uh, his mods would would protect him from from that. Uh, the the other one I noticed was uh, Destro uh, saying Slancheva. Uh, that's the looks like it's written Slainte Mahath. Uh, that's uh, Gaelic for good health, or you might say cheers. And then he says uh, subsequently, Sassanac, which is uh, again Gaelic for an English person. Uh, it's considered derogatory and it's derived from the Scottish Gaelic work for Sassanach, uh, meaning Saxon, uh, so the non Gaelic Scottish lowlanders. I think uh, a quick response to that. Uh, I wonder if uh, Hama's tipping his hand here that Destro might suspect this isn't the real Zartan, that the real Zartan would know what that means and wouldn't need hmm. the Baroness to translate. Also, I have one final uh, top-down comment, which I forgot to make earlier. Can I make it now? Go for it, yeah. Page seven, Dawn's dad, after knocking out the Fred, says, we can't kill him. He's our neighbor. We'll keep him tied up and we'll slip out of town tomorrow. And I had I read this comic right after I read Cobra Commander number three, <laughs> and uh, there has been uh, there has been some violence in Cobra Commander one and two, and there is more violence in Cobra Commander three. And I thought, what a contrast! Uh, here are two GI Joe books; they're both rated T for teen, and not that Joshua Williamson in the Energon universe is cynical or dark he's he's writing a book that has been pitched as a horror comic and here is hama writing in a it it's it's just very different yeah i'm not saying that hama doesn't use blood and i'm not saying that josh williamson only shows a lot of blood but uh what what different takes to uh captives than in these <laughs> two gi joe comics you can tie him up and uh and in one issue one one book you can do one thing in another book you can do another for sure yes so i think that is us done with gi joe 305 uh we will be back to cover 306 when that is out it's a skip month so uh 306 Ooh. returns here is 306 returns in may but we will be back to talk cobra commander issue two and three very soon with cobra commander issue three coming out the same day as issue 305 of era uh, we'll also be looking back at the devil's due era and talking to some creators along the way 
If you want to find out more about Talking Joe, you can visit talkingjoe.co.uk, which is the website. Uh, you can visit our Facebook group and get involved in the discussion. You can follow us on Twitter or, or on Instagram, and you can contact us via the website and even leave us a voicemail to, for inclusion in a future episode. And uh, we're also on YouTube. All of our episodes are getting published either as video episodes or just audio only episodes on the podcast playlist on our YouTube channel. So uh, another place to find us and a good place to leave us a message about how great you think Talking Joe is. It's always nice to hear. Uh, we're also on Patreon, patreon.com slash Talking Joe. A big thanks to our backers, Richard, Sam, Jay, Bill, Christopher, Justin, Rob, Brian, Shane, Ryan, Simon and Chris, who are all getting early access to episodes as well as some exclusive content. Tim, where can people hear from you when you're not talking to me? I'm writing the foreword to the After Action Report uh the making of silent interlude so that'll be in print this spring or summer i uh own a comic book store in somerville massachusetts that's hub comics uh i have a social media channel on youtube where my creative partners and i uh, release video essays on tv and film and i write about gi joe at my blog a real american book Good. So that is us done, but remember that nobody beats Talking Joe! Oh, wait, the other one. <clears throat> nobody beats Talking Joe, an international podcast! Uh, laters.